Hey guys, Josh with the Unconventional Compass here. Today we're going to be talking about individuation. This guide is set up to go through uh, Jordan Peterson's lectures, uh, Carl Jung's teachings, and a number of Jungian analysts' work as well, like Robert A. Johnson, for example, to give you an understanding of what individuation is, the step-by-step -step process and a number of tools for things like shadow integration and integrating the anima and self. Let's start with the symbolic world of the unconscious mind. So here's some symbolic equivalents. And the reason, you might think of a symbol as something that represents something else, but that's not exactly the right way to think about it. These, these symbols, in this sense, are elements of this domain. So the domain in, encompasses a tremendous number of phenomena. And these are some of the phenomena. So there's nature. Nature's the unconscious. Why? Well, it's beyond you. Your unconscious mind, that's not you. That's nature inside you. It does what it wants. It'll do all sorts of things you don't want it to want, what don't want it to do. And there isn't much you can do about it. And all you have to do is notice all the stupid things you've done in the last six months to understand to what degree you're in the grip of the unconscious. <coughs> You know, maybe you fall in love with someone and you don't even like them. I mean, what the hell's up with that? <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about it. You'll act like a moron, just like everybody, every human being who's ever lived acted like a moron when that happened to them. So you're gripped by it. The darkness, that's nature too. That's what lurks outside the campfire. It's like the terrible things that prey on the unwary. And of course, that's true. That's why it's not just symbolic. These things aren't just symbolic. There are monsters. You know, parents will tell their children when they have a dream, well, there's no such thing as a monster. It's like, and then, you know, then they'll tell them not to ever approach a stranger on the street because God only knows what will happen. It's like, those two things do not go together. They're either monsters or they aren't. And people are so damn afraid of them still that, you know, they torture their children to death with, with, with threats, with, with the idea of threats that don't even exist, like the probability that a given child is going to be abducted by a stranger is so close to zero that, you know, you might as well not even bother thinking about it. It's almost always a, you know, a divorced parent that comes along and grabs them and runs off with them. So, you know, well, it's a custody, it's a custody distribution most of the time. Hardly anybody gets abducted by strangers. Why would they want your child? <laughs> Nature has got this other element, too, which, which you sort of hear about it at a funeral, where it's ashes to ashes and dust to dust, right? Nature is the thing you emerge out of, like, poof, there you are. You're born, and you weren't around before, and then, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, give or take a decade, you're gone again. What did you come out of, and where do you go? Well, that's nature from a symbolic perspective, too. It's out of nothing you come, and back to nothing you go. And it makes absolutely no sense, but it doesn't matter, because that's what happens. So that's sort of nature as, as the unconscious and, and, and the devouring. And then there's the great mother, the queen, the matrix, the matriarch, the container, the cornucopia. You know what a cornucopia is? It's one of those things that you see at Thanksgiving. Weird thing, it's got this point at one end, and it opens up into a kind of a big circle. It looks like a horn. It's made out of wicker, and things pour out of it. It's like, what is that thing? <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's a cornucopia, and it's a... It's a representation of the, of the portal, in a sense, that everything flows out of. So you can think about it in some ways. You ever watch those time-lapse photographs of a flower opening? Of course you have. You know how it sort of comes out of nowhere and, and manifests itself? That's what the cornucopia is, a representation of the place from which all new forms constantly emerge. And that's what you're supposed to be thankful for at Thanksgiving, and you should be thankful for it. It's a pretty, be a pretty dismal world if that stopped happening. And then there's this, the object to be fertilized, the source of all things, the fecund and the pregnant. That, that kind of helps explain why the it's, the it's the representation of the feminine that was used to represent the unknown. Because that, the unknown is the place that all new forms emerge from. And that makes it fundamentally feminine. So, so that's one domain of <coughs> unconscious symbolism. The moon. Ruler of the night and the mysterious dark. Matter, matter, matrix, mother. Same root words. And the earth, mother earth. So those are all, those, those, all, those, all those images are related to the same under, underlying well of meaning. And, and that, that's, 
a representation of that which is always beyond you from which all new things come and to which all things return. That's the unknown. We all start out mostly unconscious. We're introduced from a young age to structure and order. There are societal rules to play by in the game of life. As a part of a collective, we grow, and our friends, family, school, church, culture, and even surrounding cultures to a lesser degree shape our personality. The Taoists call the personality the acquired mind, that is, the mind we acquire thanks to our environment. This conventional world of the external, of societal norms, rules, guidelines, and laws that help us play nice on the outside world, you can call the world of order and space. But our inner world is mostly the unconscious mind, symbolized by the tumultuous ocean and the dark unknown of the cave or abyss. Uh, this is the world of chaos and time, which returns all forms of matter to ash and dust, more or less. The unconscious is everything inside us that is outside of our conscious awareness. For a good portion of our lives, we remain mostly unconscious to our true self. The goal of individuation is to become psychologically mature, complete, balanced, and whole. To give a somewhat incomplete definition, here's a more complete definition, starting with Carl Jung. Carl Jung said this about individuation. But if we understand anything of the unconscious, we know that it cannot be swallowed. We also know that it is dangerous to suppress it because the unconscious is life, and this life turns against us if suppressed, as happens in neurosis. Conscious and unconscious do not make a whole when one of them is suppressed and injured by the other. If they must contend, at least let it be a fair fight with equal rights on both sides. Both are aspects of life. Consciousness should defend its reason and protect itself, and the chaotic life of the unconscious should be given the chance of having its way too, as much of it as we can stand. This means open conflict and open collaboration at once. That, evidently, is the way human life should be. It is the old game of hammer and anvil. Between them, the patient iron is forged into an indestructible whole, an individual. This, roughly, is what I mean by the individuation process. Robert A. Johnson explains in Inner Work, this process of actualizing oneself and becoming more complete also reveals one's special individual structure. It shows how the universal human traits and possibilities are combined in each individual in a way that is unlike anyone else. Jung writes in two essays on analytical psychology, individuation means becoming an individual. And insofar as individuality embraces our innermost, last, and incomparable uniqueness, it also implies becoming one's own self. We could therefore translate individuation as coming into selfhood or self-realization. So there's this story, King Arthur. There's this story of King Arthur. The, they're all in a round table, right? King Arthur and his knights, they're all equals. They're all superordinate, but they're all equals. And they go off to look for the Holy Grail. And the Holy Grail is the container of the redemptive substance, whatever that is. It might be the the cup that Christ used at the Last Supper, or it might be a chalice that was used to capture his blood on the cross, right, when he was pierced by a sword. The stories differ, but that's the Holy Grail, and the Holy Grail is lost. That's the redemptive substance, and the knights of King Arthur go off to search for the Holy Grail, and, but they don't know where to look. So where do you look when you don't know where to look for something you need desperately but have lost? Well, each of the knights goes into the forest at the point that looks darkest to him. And that's Jungian psychoanalysis in a nutshell. It's like that which you fear and avoid, that which you hold in contempt, that which disgusts you and that you avoid. That's the gateway to what you need to know. There's nothing new age about that. That's for sure. 
Now, Jung, when he started this endeavor, he started with this. This is part of the notebooks from the Black Book. He said, he wrote, my soul, my soul, where are you? Do you hear me? I speak. I call you. Are you there? I've returned. I'm here again. I've shaken the dust of all the lands from my feet. And I've come to you. I am with you. After long years of long wandering, I have come to you again. For the Jungians, the, the hero's journey is a journey within. There are three stages to the individuation process. Stage one, integrate the shadow. Stage two, integrate the anima or animus. And stage three, integrate the self. Let's start with the shadow. Jung had this idea that people's shadows reach all the way down to hell, which is actually a very frightening concept. And what he meant by that is, is that if you take a look at the impulses that drive you that are actually malevolent, if you can admit to such impulses, that if you basically follow those all the way down to their origin, you find some very nasty things. And what you find down there basically is what allies you with people who've done terrible things. And that, that's not a very pleasant experience, I would say, although one thing that's worth thinking about is that it is something that can protect you against being very, very badly hurt. Because one of the things that characterizes people who develop post-traumatic stress disorder is that they're often naive. And then they encounter something that's really not within their framework of thinking, and it's usually something bad. And because there, there isn't anything in their philosophy, their way of looking at the world that has prepared them for that, they end up fragmented and devastated. And so it's actually protective to you if you can figure out what your, what your full range of capabilities is, because that can help you understand other people a lot better. And, and, uh, to be wiser and more careful in your actions. It's also useful, I think, if you want to convince yourself to act properly, because if you regard yourself as harmless, which is a big mistake, then nothing you can do is really that bad, right? Because you're harmless after all. But if you understand that you're seriously not harmless, then that can make you a lot more careful with yourself. The shadow archetype represents all the personal traits we have repressed, the drives and behaviors we ignore or deny, often in response to societal conditioning. The shadow holds many terrifying things that we don't want to become, but like the archetypal motif of the treasure guarded by the dragon in the cave, there's gold in the shadow, things you should bring into the conscious world, tools you can use to your benefit. You might have repressed most or all forms of aggress aggression, for example, in response to your parents, school, church, friends, whatever. But aggression can be channeled into healthy behavior, of course, like negotiating for a higher salary or competing in sports or defending yourself or your family when necessary. Joseph Campbell said, Jung's concept is that the aim of one's life, psychologically speaking, should not be to suppress or repress, but to come to know one's other side, and so both to enjoy and to control the whole range of one's capabilities, or capacities, excuse me, i.e. in the full sense, to know oneself. In the process of knowing yourself, or exploring the abyss, there is a wealth of hidden gems to be found in that shadow. You might call them weapons or tools or instruments that you can use on the path to individuation. Carl Jung said, recognizing the shadow is what I call the apprentice piece, but making out with the anima is the masterpiece which not many can bring off. Making out meaning something uh, completely different than you're probably thinking right now. In other words, shadow work is what Jung would have you focus on first, kind of the beginning stage, but anima or animus integration is the big leagues the rare masterpiece only a select few manage to complete. 